Uh, today I'll be presenting uh, about the secondary and tertiary uh, prevention of cervical cancer. And uh, as uh, uh, we all know what screening is, it is checking for disease when there are no symptoms. So uh, for cervical cancer, this particular uh, thing is very important because it helps to identify pre-invasive lesions and early detection of cancer and uh, causes no harm during treatment. And uh, even patients are followed up uh, regular at regular intervals if they are subjected to a proper screening program. So as uh, Dr. Ayush has very well highlighted, highlighted in his previous talk uh, that uh, uh, human papilloma virus is the essential cause of cervical cancer and uh, these high-risk HPV types have been very well elaborated, which attribute to 75% of cervical cancers and 50% of vaginal and vulvar cancers. So briefly, I'll talk about the natural history of cervical cancer. Uh, initially, uh, women, when they are infected with HPV virus, most of the women clear up the infection within a year, but uh, some of them are actually not able to clear it and the infection persists, which then converts into a CIN1, which is a low-grade lesion. And approximately 80 to 90% of these ladies then revert back, clear the infection and actually become uh, normal. But uh, around 20 to 30 percent cases of CIN1 can actually convert to CIN2. But this uh, time from CIN1 to CIN2 to CIN3, which is again a higher grade of the disease, is a long time. It takes up to three to 10 years for CIN1 to convert to CIN3. And once CIN3 occurs, there is a 40% chance that it converts into a squamous cell carcinoma. But again, this time frame is very long. It takes around five to 10 years for a CIN3 to convert to squamous cell carcinoma. So in this uh, uh, picture, I'm just highlighting how important it is to uh, uh, screen uh, for cervical cancer because it gives us a long time, around 15 years. And in 15 years, we can uh, detect the pre-invasive pre-malignant lesions and actually treat them before they get converted to a squamous cell cancer. So how does uh, the human papilloma virus actually damages the DNA. Um, uh, the human papilloma virus has two very virulent proteins, the E6 and the E7 protein, which uh, E6 binds to the tumor suppressor gene P53 and it inhibits it, which uh, inhibits cell apoptosis. So whatever cell with DNA damage is there, it actually goes on proliferating. Similarly, the E7 protein binds to the RB or the retinoblastoma gene. And again, it causes the inhibition of the RB gene which uh, leads to the inhibition of cell apoptosis and proliferation of cancerous cells. So now we come to whom to screen, like what should be the target group uh, for women with, who should undergo screening and what are the screening methods available? So the women target group is mostly women in the age of 30 to 65 years of age. And uh, what are the uh, different methods available for screening? Uh, first and foremost, uh, the HPV DNA screening, which uh, uh, screening test, which is the one which is uh, most sensitive, is very specific, and is endorsed by WHO and various other international and national agencies also for a primary uh, cervical cancer screening. And we have the conventional pap test also and liquid-based cytologies, which are similar. And they are cytological examination of the cervical cells with, uh, uh, they're very uh, sensitive, although LBC is uh, more sensitive than a conventional pap test. But uh, uh, both these tests are less sensitive than the HPV DNA test. And they have drawbacks like they require a well-dedicated uh, cytopathological lab and pathologist to actually be able to interpret the result correctly. And the last but not the very least is VIA, which uh, has a very high sensitivity and specificity from 85 to 90% and uh, is the uh, screening test your choice because it is very easy to be done. It can be done even by uh, paramedical trained professionals and uh, it is cheap, does not require any cost and is the one uh, test to look out for in low, limited, uh, low or limited resource settings. So first and foremost, uh, I will talk about the HPV DNA test. Uh, HPV is responsible for 50% cases of CIN2 and 75% cases of CIN3. So it's very important that we actually go ahead with screening for the HPV DNA. 
the WHO, which has been the uh, main body behind all the regulations for HPV DNA testing. They also recommend using this HPV DNA detection as a primary screening test rather than via or cytology screening. Uh, and this treatment approach is adapted for the general population as well as for women living with HIV. And WHO even goes on to suggest that in, patient, in areas where uh, the resources are limited, uh, the patients can be treated on the basis of a screen and treat approach, which says that uh, decision to treatment is based just on a positive primary screening test. And in this, it is preferred that the positive primary screening test is an HPV DNA test. So why is it said that HPV DNA testing is the way to go? Because it has a very high sensitivity. It has the highest sensitivity among all the tests, 96% as compared to the conventional cytology or pap smear, which is 53%. It has slightly lower specificity, but we can say that it's approaching 90%, which is a relatively acceptable standard. And there are multiple uh, multicentric RCTs worldwide, which have also provided data that uh, HPV testing provides better protection against invasive cervical cancer as compared to cytology alone. So what are the types of HPV DNA tests which are available in the market? Uh, there are uh, DNA-based multiplex assays, or they may be uh, mRNA tests, which is mostly depending upon the expression of the E6 and E7 oncoproteins. So these are the tests which are available in the market, uh, Hybrid Capture 2, Care, HPV, Servista, Cobas, Aptima, of which Cobas is a relatively costly test with uh, each uh, testing costing about rupees 4,000 and the rest of the test uh, vary in cost from 1,000 to 1,500 rupees depending on their genotyping abilities. So coming to the most important part of HPV DNA testing, that is point of care testing. A point of care testing is very important because it uh, circumvents limitations like processing time, lab infrastructure, the cost, and it is very efficacious in low medical, med middle income countries like ours and high risk HIV population. It gives the test result at the site of the testing. And uh, there are various uh, uh, point of care HPV testing available, which are Avantage E6 uh, uh, strip test or Gene Expert HPV. But uh, uh, I would like to draw all of your attention towards uh, true NAT HPV testing because uh, this is a PCR-based uh, point-of-care testing, which is portable, and it has been manufactured by an Indian diagnostic company, that is Molbio Diagnostics, based in Goa. So it is our own uh, home brand of TrueNAT uh, of HPV DNA testing, and it provides a good semi-quantitative estimation of high-risk HPV, that is HPV 16, 18, 31, and 45. It can be used in community settings. It can be used in patients uh, in whom we are advising or uh, who are comfortable with self-sampling for HPV DNA, and reports are available within an hour. So using this TrueNAT HPV uh, testing, a study was uh, done at Ames Rishikesh, uh, and it was a cross-sectional study, which was conducted uh, from December 2020 to June 22 to determine the prevalence of high-risk HPV in self-collected vaginal samples using this particular technology, and also to study the acceptability of self-sampling among the women. And 975 women residing in a semi-urban locality of Uttarakhand were included, and they underwent TrueNAT testing. And uh, this particular TrueNet testing was then validated in all the positive samples using a standard uh, HPV 1618 RT-PCR, that is genes to make it. So the results of this study showed that uh, out of 975, 45, that is 4.6 women tested positive by uh, TrueNAT. And out of these 45 women, 44 women, when they were validated using this RT-PCR test, they tested positive. So the concordance rate was approaching 95%. Uh, for uh, uh, TrueNAT and the standard RT-PCR. And out of these 45 women, uh, approximately 50% underwent colposcopy and were treated, uh, treated accordingly. And the very important part of this study was to uh, see the acceptability of self-sampling. And 96% uh, of participants felt that they were very satisfied with self-sampling and 94% felt it was comfortable to them. And 88% stated that they will strongly recommend it to the other eligible women also. So this study uh, was uh, instrumental in concluding that the point of care testing is a feasible uh, 
community uh, feasible in community and self sampling was acceptable among the uh, ladies so recommendations for primary hpv testing i will uh, like to highlight the who and the foxy that is a federation of gynecologists society of in obstetric and gynecologists uh, of india and uh, i would like to say that uh, how they uh, uh, like how they tell to do hpv testing is uh, the starting age in both the recommendations is 30 years and uh, who suggests that it should be repeated every 5 to 10 years if normal and foxy suggests that uh, it should be repeated 5 years if it is normal and um, when to stop who says that it can be stopped at 50 years whereas foxy says it uh, says that it should be continued at up to 65 years of age and the hiv population is a, a very uh, special population why because they are more prone to hpv infections so both these guidelines suggest that hpv testing should be started uh, within a year of sexual activity or 25 years and they should be screened at a more frequent interval than that of a normal population so coming to other test methods, uh, screening methods, first is uh, VIA. VIA is visual inspection with acetic acid. Uh, this will be covered in much detail by Vanna ji in the next uh, uh, session. And uh, it uh, implies the application of three to 5% concentration acetic acid over the cervix. And this is how an abnormal cervix looks like. This is the white plaque like lesion is an abnormal lesion. And this is due to the coagulation of the proteins by the acetic acid and uh, cancer cells having more proteins they get white due to uh, this particular application uh, similar uh, uh, application uh, a similar result is also obtained via willy willy is visual inspection with leucoalcidine and this is how a normal cervix looks this is the black brownish uh, uh, color is due to glycogen so a normal cervix has glycogen so it uptakes well whereas this is a diseased cervix and this is how mustard yellow like it looks why because the glycogen content of cancerous cells or precancerous cells is low and so the uptake of iodine is also low so uh, coming to the third uh, test that is pap smear pap smear uh, is a very simple screening test but again as highlighted before they uh, have uh, the need for a very dedicated cytopathologist to interpret the results and since we see here how the samples are connected using a brush and using this spatula and then they're smeared onto the slide there may be uh, some uh, discrepancies at the time of collection also there can be drying artifacts there may be blood or mucus or any discharge present which can affect the findings uh, so uh, liquid based cytology is similar to uh, pap smear in this uh, this brush is used to collect the cervical cells and then it is disp uh, disp dispersed into this uh, liquid media then this liquid media is sent to the cytopathologist and then they uh, process it and then prepare a slide uh, with liquid based cytology the uh, advantage is that we have a few uh, unsatisfactory slides or smears but again a dedicated cytopathologist is needed for uh, reporting so uh, coming to uh, how frequently should we test using these different modalities with hpv dna as i've already said before it should be every five to ten years as recommended by who pap testing if done alone should be repeated every three years if negative initially co-testing that is pap and hpv dna test it is only recommended for women more than 30 years it's not very cost effective as we do both hpv and uh, pap testing and it has a similar uh, sensitivity and specificity uh, in fact, slightly lower than HPV DNA. So we normally don't do it. And uh, VIA is recommended once in every five years if the initial testing is found out to be negative. So once an abnormal screening test is detected, so what are the uh, different types of pathologies which can be seen as an abnormal uh, screening test? We can have CIN1, which was discussed earlier as a low-grade uh, squamous intraepithelial lesion or CIN2 and CIN3, which can in ultimately lead to a micro invasion kind of picture. So uh, this particular uh, thing when it presents and then we need to uh, treat this particular pre-invasive lesion and the treatment of this particular pre-invasive lesion is what we will cover in tertiary prevention. And in tertiary prevention, uh, the thing which 
uh, we all should know is a colposcopy. It is a universally uh, diagnostic, uh, universally available diagnostic tool for evaluating any abnormal pap test. And detection of microinvasive or invasive carcinoma is very well aided via this colposcopy directed biopsies. So it helps in the treatment of pre-malignant lesions as well as the diagnosis of cervical cancer. So this is how a colposcopy equipment looks like. And uh, this is the state of the art binocular colposcope, which uh, is the ideal instrument for um, uh, um, taking the biopsies. And uh, they have this binocular head, and then there's a light source here. This is the stand. Again, this is a portable thing, but uh, sometimes uh, binocular may not be available. So we have a video colposcope here. It's very similar. There is no uh, ocular lens to actually look into it. It's everything is projected into a attached personal computer or a uh, attached television. And this again is uh, further simplified to a portable colposcope, as we can see here how it is handheld and very easy to carry. And this is a mobile app on which the colposcopy data can be stored, colposcope uh, and uh, results interpreted. So once your colposcopy is done and we see that there is some kind of a lesion in the cervix, then they need to be treated. They get treated either by thermal ablation, that is by heat injury, cryotherapy, that is by cold uh, coagulation, LEAP, which is an excisional procedure, or a cold knife conization, which is excisional as well as a diagnostic procedure. Your voice is lost. Ma'am, am I on? Yeah, but it's disappearing. Yeah, you can finish fast. So therapy probes and they use this station uh, of intracellular water for the destruction of the cancerous cells and the two gases. Am I audible, ma'am? Hello? Yes, please carry on. Okay. The two gases used are either nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide. So it's a very easily done procedure. And these are heated and applied onto the cervical epithelium, and this is how it causes the damage to the. It is how it uh, damages the cancerous cells or the pre-malignant lesion. Again, then we uh, go on to leap or lets. That is using these uh, loop and uh, using this electrosurgical unit. Uh, we sorry, we actually cauterize the entire uh, uh, transformation zone in the cervix, and we remove this part of the cervical epithelium and some part of endocervical canal. And it's also a very good procedure for treatment of pre-malignant lesions. Similar is conization, but instead of uh, electrosurgical unit, we are using a, a regular cold uh, uh, scalpel to actually remove the transformation zone and some part of the cervical canal. Now, once the pre-malignant lesion is treated, patient can be put on follow-up. But sometimes we see cases of uh, uh, invasive cervical cancer upon colposcopy or on biopsies. So uh, briefly touching upon the different treatment strategies in stage one, we all know that the cancer is limited to cervix. It is managed by a radical hysterectomy. The surgery is much different than just removal of uterus. So it's a relatively technically difficult surgery also. And sometimes depending on the histopath, the patient may need post-operative radiotherapy. So it's a curable uh, disease at this point of time. In stage two, the cancer extends beyond the cervix. And here there is no roll up upfront surgery. So she needs a combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Uh, in stage three, the cancer is extended to the vagina and pelvic tissue near the side wall, and it becomes more and more difficult to treat the patient. She requires a combination of uh, com uh, chemo and radiation, and there's no roll-up uptrend surgery here also. The stage four, the cancer is actually metastatic with distant mets or extension to the bladder and rectum. Treatment is very difficult and survival rates are poor in spite of therapy and radiotherapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy are the options available. Surgery can only be done in palliative cases. So briefly coming on to the important uh, points from this presentation that screening for cervical cancer is a must to identify pre-invasive lesions. Why? Because it has a long pre-malignant phase before it develops into cervical cancer. HPV DNA testing is the modality for primary screening recommended by WHO. Uh, VIA can be used for screening in limited resource settings. 
the point of care HPV tests will be the way to go for community screening. Pre-invasive lesions of cervix are easily managed by thermal ablation, cryosurgery, or excisional procedures. An invasive carcinoma of cervix is difficult to manage. Radical surgery is option only in stage one disease. Advanced stages need chemotherapy and radiation.